Monica, thank you very much. Uh, though, at least I think so. We'll see in a minute. Uh, it's a pretty daunting question that you asked, and so I brainstormed with a, a handful of my colleagues, and the only thing that was, I mean, nothing was clear about the future of design out of those conversations, but one thing that was clear was uh, that I couldn't come to an architecture school and not show pictures. Um, <laughs> The, the problem is, of course, I don't design anything, and so I don't really have any designs to show, so I thought the next best thing was to show your design. Um, and so this is gonna be a presentation about Monica's work. Um, <laughs> because that is the future of design. Um, and, and, and I mean this um, actually quite seriously. Um, the image on the screen is a rendering prepared I don't know, probably years ago, uh, as part of the design of a new headquarters for my firm in Lower Manhattan. This image was, is a photograph, uh, and it was taken just a few days ago as the project's nearing completion. Both images depict a sky lobby in the office building. The design you see is by uh, Monica and Nadir, as well as, um, of course, Harry Cobb. Uh, what's most interesting to me is not the design per se, though of course it's spectacular, uh, but it's really the uncanny resemblance of the, of the image to the photograph, the rendering to the reality. The rendering's certainly skillful, but it's not, I think, especially skillful for this moment in time. It's good, but this is what your profession does. But what's most interesting is if you look over the course of a few years, the power of visualization tools has grown at an extraordinary at an extraordinary pace. The skill is um, uh, is is hard to imagine. That you know that it doesn't take a bold prediction to say that the that, that for unsophisticated observers, the power of the tools will enable you to be immersed in a three dimensional digital environment that you will soon be equipped to participate in, uh, maybe even to very strongly direct and influence the course of the design process. The mystery, maybe, of the creative process is becoming a bit more accessible. And I say this even to clients. Um, and so I think the trained professional's ability to, that special ability to synthesize a three-dimensional reality in the mind's eye from a two-dimensional analytical um, set of drawings is really no longer the prerequisite to comprehend even the most complicated or, or subtle designs. The growing transparency in the design process is important, I think, maybe even transformative, but it's also, uh, I think, comes with um, some caution, I think particular caution for design professionals, and I think maybe even the basis of a, of a call to action. Change in the, in the process itself will inevitably drive change in the outcome, and the product will, of course, be different. How different if it's orchestrated through a linear, more filmic process rather than uh, that the, the synchronous um, uh, understanding that comes from the, the uh, assemblage of, uh, of abstract drawings and, and models. Clients who understand work through that kind of immersive cinematic sequence, a storyboard made up of renderings uh, in this instance or maybe a fully rendered three-dimensional animation, will be empowered to look not only at the architecture in a new way, but maybe beyond, maybe um, even taking for granted the architecture to think much more intently about the design of the experience itself. Uh, and so uh, I think that, you know, the more self-evident the architecture becomes, the greater the focus will turn away towards the engineering of the space itself, light, color, texture, temperature, humidity, not the bricks and mortar, um, not the fixtures and equipment. Of course, buildings and equipment will need to be designed and there will be architects and, and engineers to do it as there always have been. But what interests me most, I think, is a new role that's evolving at the center of the design process. And that is the gathering, the defining, and the authoring of the requirements that are the object of the design. Where will the expertise come from to first specify continuously cr critique and then finally determine whether or not a particular design is fit for purpose. More focus on the design of the experience will put the client's requirements even more front and center than they are now. 
if clients are inherently closer to their own needs and architects closer to form giving and building, then it's predictable that the client or, or maybe specialized consultants who work for the client will emerge as the experts in that specification of the experience. This more open process will bring more focus to the performance of building and ultimately drive the demand for a much more rigorous assessment of their needs. Does it work? But does it work most importantly according to the assessment of the client? That will take precedence over all other concerns. Probably second will be does it express the culture of the client and the client's organization? And maybe, maybe third but somewhat harder, certainly harder to measure is will, uh, is to what extent will design not only express or articulate but also engender the culture of the client. Now, not long ago in my organization, we replaced our in-house design and construction department which was largely staffed by people with um, professional design training with a department that works much more closely with our businesses, not with architects, not with contractors, but to understand the metrics of our business's productivity and in turn to be what we've taken to calling, and I think with all due apology to some of the people in the audience, the industrial engineers of space in relation to the business process. The people in this d department typically have quantitative or analytical training, uh, but not necessarily training in physical design. Yet this is the team that authors the requirements at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day measures whether or not the design performs. That it works may sound prosaic, particularly in, in, in light of so many compelling images uh, already over the course of the day, but it's not a trivial matter to say that something works to be constructible, sustainable, maintainable, fit, pr fit for purpose, and to have strong economics over the full life cycle of, uh, of the asset. Now, and I don't talk about fit for purpose or it works to make light of the expressive power of design. Uh, in fact, I, I learned quite a lot about the expressive power of design um, uh, early in my career working for the Walt Disney Company. As an Imagineer, I learned to conceive of, of, of the purely architectural as sitting at one end of a spectrum of design expression with uh, the theatrical at the other end of the spectrum, where purely architectural um, purely architectural uh, um, work was more somehow about itself, about its function, its material, its construction, its order, its history, and the theatrical more devoted to the telling of, uh, of an objective narrative or story. But of course it doesn't have to be Adventureland or Tomorrowland uh, or Frontierland for architects to be more explicitly expressing the culture of the client than their interests. For the story to be, for the story of the architecture to be more about me, frankly, than it is about you. Um, so uh, early in the uh, early in the design of our headquarters project, that that, that this is uh, a, you know one piece of a project that involved a dozen different firms in collaboration: Harry Cobb, Scott Cohen, uh, Shop, ARO, SOM, Gensler, uh, KPMB, Ken Smith, Pete Aldolf. We asked each member of the team to write the story of their design. The stories were ex exchanged, edited, and rewritten in the expectation that each designer's unique chapter would nonetheless be part of a coherent whole, an overarching narrative, but frankly, our narrative. Whether this, and uh, somebody else used the word democratization of, uh, of the design process, process ultimately is interesting or not, I think is an open question, but it will happen. Uh, I think of, uh, mass uh, customization, that was a phrase also used, I, I think of it as, as something that uh, Shop has taught me about, or rapid manufacture, which we've also seen already today, as potential aspects of the upside of that democratization. But the debasement of the role of the professional could also be a part of the story, uh, uh, you know, uh, lost in a, in a cacophony of, of uh, newly empowered uh, uh, voices. Viewed most darkly, if the empowerment of the amateur client has unintended and potentially untoward consequences. What might be the outcome of the empowerment of the amateur public? Uh, well, uh, as clients become more effective in advancing their parochial agenda, it will be even more necessary to adjudicate and balance and integrate the needs of the client 
with the crucially important system systemic, uh, systematic rather, demands and needs of the broader public. The allocation of shared but increasingly scarce resources, light, water, air, infrastructure capacities, land, the development of more rigorous health and safety standards, and of course the, uh, the, the broad impacts of, uh, uh, the, the much broader environmental impacts of the built environment. So uh, I think the more transparent the design process, the more important it will be for the professions to stake out higher ground and adopt a comprehensive and, a, and, a, and I think maybe a formal comprehensive code of ethics and standards that require of the profession that it balance and intensify its engagement both with the client on the one hand and with the public and their broader interests on the other. Thanks. <laughs>